A couple of videos ago, I got some comments that I felt were worth discussing and responding to, so here they are. I hate it when atheists try to quote the Bible to make a point. You guys are so dishonest, saying Jesus was a racist due to his saying to the Gentile woman what he said. If you are going to quote Jesus, give the entire quote. When she answered, his response proves he was not a racist. You leave that out. Do not lie, but give the entire quotation. Taking words out of context or giving part of what was spoken is sleazy and dishonest, and you should be above such things. Okay, I don't agree that what happened afterwards makes anything any better, so I should have discussed this further. If you want to read the entire thing for yourself, here's where it is in the Bible. But here's my paraphrasing. A Gentile woman goes to Jesus, seeks him out, and asks him to heal her daughter, who is possessed by a demon, and he outright refuses, saying, quote, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Let's pause right there. Jesus is refusing to help a Gentile woman because she is a Gentile. He's essentially saying that what he is doing is for the Jews and not for anyone else. That's pretty racist. But Christians still like to point to the story to say that Jesus was not racist and that salvation is for everyone. And that's because of, well, what happens later. So let's keep going. The woman begs Jesus and keeps begging him. And eventually, Jesus relented. That's it. You see, Jesus was healing loads of people, loads of Jews, just everywhere. Sometimes they didn't even have to ask him. But when a Gentile asks for help, he refuses and maybe relents if they beg. So salvation is for everyone, and Jesus wasn't discriminatory. See, Christians miss the point. They think that Jesus was putting on a show to show that his salvation is for everyone. But that's clearly not what happened. It was the other way around. The Gentile woman had to put on a show in order to get any help from Jesus. This was still discriminatory, even if he did relent eventually. Listen to your words. Natural selection selects. You speak of evolution and natural selection as sentient beings doing things as only a sentient being would. No, I don't. I really don't. Maybe I'm speaking about it in a way that you can't completely understand because you don't understand evolution or natural selection. And that's fine. Maybe I should go into a bit more detail, which I will. But in no way was I implying or saying that natural selection does anything that requires intelligence. Yes, mutations, you even admit, usually go downward, are harmful. Okay, let's pause right there. I did say that mutations usually are harmful, but that's actually not entirely true. I should have thought about it further, and what I meant to say is that every mutation that changes the phenotype, or that you can see the effects of, usually are harmful, but most mutations in general are completely neutral and don't do anything at all. But you say go downward. And that's a very vague statement, very undefined, very hard to argue against because I don't really know what that means. And that's tricky. A lot of creationists fall into holes just from semantics. If you can accept and use very loosely defined terms, then you're only going by very abstract concepts that may not actually reflect reality. But let's keep going. So since the majority are harmful, whatever beneficial ones there might be would not be enough to jump from one organism to another. You're saying that since most mutations that affect the phenotype are harmful, and therefore they would completely overshadow any beneficial ones, and as a result, organisms can never transition to one kind from another. Again, using very vague, unscientific terms. But there are problems with this, as you can imagine. One is natural selection, which maybe you don't understand. That's fine. But here's how that works. An organism from a certain species is born with a mutation that is harmful. Maybe this organism can't move as fast as the rest of the species. And as a result, 
this organism is less fit to survive in its environment and less fit to survive against predators. So when predators come around, the slower, weaker ones will be eaten first. So because the organisms with this specific trait would be more likely to die and would be killed more than everyone else, it is much less likely that these organisms would reproduce and carry on these traits to the rest of the species. So in that way, yeah, there can be many, many, many harmful mutations, but they're not going to go very far because these organisms are not going to be able to produce very well. But for beneficial mutations, the exact opposite is true. Say, an organism of a species has stronger legs, is able to move faster, then these organisms are going to be able to run ahead of the pack should there be a predator. And that means that should predators attack, these faster, stronger organisms would be more likely to survive, and as such, it would be more likely to reproduce, especially over time as this keeps happening and they keep reproducing. And you say that the term selection implies intelligence? For one thing, it doesn't. But even if it does, then that's what the word natural is for, is to say that this selection is done by nature. And another thing, you say that beneficial mutations will not be enough to jump from one organism to another. But that's not how it works. We don't jump from one organism to another. We jump from one organism to the same organism, but slightly different to the same organism, but maybe slightly different again. See, evolution works by an accumulation of many changes over a long period of time. We don't change from one kind of animal to another kind. Nobody's saying that except creationists. I am still waiting to hear some evolutionist explain to me how if the eye evolved over millions of years, how the creature with the two eyes was able to find food, mate, and escape predators if he could not see in all that time. I don't think you understand the evolution of the eye. When we say that it evolved over millions of years, we're not saying that it built up part by part by part to become what it is today. And it seems to me like that's what you're saying. When we say it evolved over millions of years, we mean that there were predecessors to the eye that worked perhaps in similar ways to the eye, but not nearly as well. And over time, these structures changed and changed and formed into the eyes that we know today. But to answer your question, before there were eyes on any organism, organisms could clearly survive without eyes. Now, this was more of a unicellular early Earth. These organisms survived much in the same way that bacteria survive nowadays they were very similar. But eventually, some of these unicellular organisms had proteins that were sensitive to light. But as organisms became multicellular, essentially just by grouping into groups of cells, some of these cells were sensitive to light by a special protein. But every step along the way, as the eye changed and changed and changed, it was still working. It was still functioning. Every step along the way was beneficial to the organism because it could see a little bit more. You could see in a little bit more detail. And these organisms were very simple. They didn't require food the way we require food because eyes evolved so early and they didn't have the same predators as we have today and they didn't have the same methods of reproduction as we do. After all, if this is the first time that the eye evolved, it's not like its predator had eyes to see it. But I mean, take sponges, for example. Sponges are animals, and they survive just fine without any resemblance of an eye. Quote, shallow water fish started pushing themselves from the bottom using their limbs. Unquote. You say such things as though they are factual, when in reality you are just hypothesizing. My point in saying that was that limbs did not need to evolve instantaneously, as David was suggesting that it did. I didn't necessarily need to point out exactly how limbs evolved, but just showing that limbs could have evolved slowly 
would have proven my point. But if you were to research the evolution of tetrapods, you would find that what I said is very, very in line with what a lot of scientists have found. Your statements are ridiculous. Argumentum ad lapidum. I can see the confusion in your eyes as you speak. No, you don't. You perceive confusion because you want me to be confused, but I definitely was not confused. If I did make a face, there are several reasons that that could be so. For one, if I recall correctly, this was a scripted video, meaning I had to memorize every line, line for line. And that can be difficult to do, especially since I'm trying to minimize on cuts. And because of that, I try to say as much as I can without making a break in speech. But there's also two bright lights glaring straight into my face as I record. So maybe that could make me squint a little bit sometimes. But no, I am not confused. And you don't get to tell me when I am. As he said, while this fish was developing, evolving, a predator fish would have eaten it. What I have been saying for eons, fish with stronger limbs could move faster and avoid predators better. Every step along the way was better for the organism. An organism having stronger fins to push itself around faster means it's faster than the rest of them and everybody else is going to get eaten but the fastest ones. And that'll continue as the fins get stronger and stronger till eventually, if it's able to walk around on land, there's no predators there. So that would be a haven for it. That would be so beneficial in regards to predators because this is when legs evolved. This is the first time animals walked on land. And this isn't far-fetched. Again, mud skippers, they do this. They live and walk outside of the water. But I mean, there is information out here for this. Research the evolution of tetrapods. There's a Wikipedia page and also this. Links in the description in case you actually care. If, for instance, creatures accustomed to the sea started developing legs so they could hop up onto land, they would never survive. That is not true. You are over-exaggerating exactly how legs evolved. The complex structures that creationists point to, like the eye, limbs, digestive system, respiratory system, these things have evolved for a long, long, long time. They didn't just suddenly appear. There were precursors to it and precursors to those precursors, all on a gradual climb to where it is today. But no, a fish that is able to walk out onto water is not going to die right off the bat. Mud skippers, remember them? Those animals already on the land who were already experts on land travel would have eaten them up. You can't be serious right now. This would be the first and perhaps only time that animals started walking on land. Why would there be any land animals? Before this, there were no land animals. This is where land animals began. There were no land predators for the first organisms to walk on land. These evolving organisms would not have survived, and vice versa. Those land animals that evolved to live in the sea for some unknown reason. If these organisms did in fact die, that would be natural selection at work. But the thing is, everything along the way was beneficial. So natural selection worked in their favor. Maybe you don't understand what the benefit is. Even if we didn't, it would still be there and it would still be evident that it was beneficial because natural selection does take place. The fish, quote, were naturally selected, unquote. Selected. By whom? Let's break this down simply. Natural selection. Natural. Nature. Natural selection. Selection by nature. So, in natural selection, who selects? Nature. If they were naturally selected, a being had to do that selecting. You see, you speak of these things as though they are deities, but then you blow a gasket if people believe in a deity. First of all, I don't blow a gasket for people who believe in a god. I understand that people believe in gods, and I sort of understand why. But more to the point, I don't think of these things as deities. 
you just don't understand them. Natural selection isn't an entity on its own. It is a term used to describe a phenomena, a process. I mean, take the primitive fish, for example. If they use their limbs or fins to push themselves along the bottom of the water, then it would be beneficial if one of them mutated to have stronger muscles in its limbs. That way it could move faster. And because it could move faster, then it could more easily avoid predators. Likewise, if one of these primitive fish had weaker muscles in its limbs due to a mutation, then it would be less likely to survive should a predator come. Maybe it's a weird term, but that's natural selection. Maybe it will help if you don't think of natural selection as its own thing, but replace natural selection with environmental pressures. It doesn't take a deity for faster fish to survive better than slower fish. Your own speech patterns point to a designer while you rant and rail against the idea of said designer. My ideas don't point to a designer. If you think it does, please tell me and I will explain why it doesn't. The Jews were not so special. They were condemned repeatedly. I know you know this already are just being duplicitious again. But the whole thing is, the God who chose the Jews did so as a way of showing himself to the world. It is not that racism is his idea, it is that he chose to reveal himself to this one nation, a puny nation, that their ancestor Abraham was called by him and he believed. Okay, the Bible clearly states in this verse that God favors the Jews, and he favors the Jews because they are a small nation. But ask yourself why? See, if God chose this small nation so that he could use this small nation to show his own power, then he didn't do a very good job because Israel was conquered lots and lots and lots. But maybe he only really cared about the people in it, and he wants those people to be saved. But why? You say that he showed himself eventually to everyone via Jesus, despite the fact that Jesus was only there for the Jews, as he himself said. Why would he only choose this small nation to be able to be saved? Why wouldn't he show himself to everyone? I mean, after all, he should have the ability, right? By favoring this one small nation, he's essentially condemning every other nation of human beings that he created. You see, this story makes much more sense if you think of it as if God doesn't exist, as if the Israelites made this God up somewhere along the way. After all, Yahweh was the God of Israel. If Israel made up this God to show that God is always on their side, to lift their morale, and to say that this is our protector, then it makes much more sense. Get the chip off your shoulder and be honest.